just want to just want to put a disclaimer that we are recording this. Uh, so just so everyone knows, it probably just started. And uh, also want to just start out with some housekeeping. There was a pretest, sort of a knowledge check that we typically put out at the very beginning. And then we will have it out at the end. So I'm hoping that we can slide that there in the chat box. Um, why don't we do this? I, I am uh, very welcoming of your participation, either verbally or in the chat box. I would really love to have that. So uh, if you have not filled out the knowledge pre-check, would you mind putting uh, some sort of indication in the chat box that you need the pretest or you haven't done it? Uh, that way we just know how many people we're waiting for to go ahead and push that link to. Jenny, thanks for, thanks for the support. I see you there. <laughs> yes, it's, it's in there. Okay. So it's in the chat box right now? Yeah. Okay. The pretest link. Perfect. I haven't seen it. I must have a different chat box because I'm the host or something. Well, maybe I did it before every week. Maybe it. Oh, I, I think the way as people sign on, they only get what's in the chat box after they signed on. They don't see the history. That makes sense. So, I for example, <laughs> I've got nothing from from whatever was discussed before I signed on. Only only once I signed on. So we'll go ahead and put that link in the chat and maybe we can just take a couple of moments right now to fill out the pretest because that'll be an important part of the project. We wanna make sure we collect that information. Perfect. So then I'm gonna just set myself a little five minute timer and then I'll be back. I'll give everyone a moment to click, click over to whatever your favorite browser is and, and complete that pretest. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and give it another minute or two, and then we will begin. Thanks so much for going over to that link and completing that uh, knowledge pre-check. Okay, uh, I think what we will probably do is go ahead and close down that uh, pretest now since we have uh, gotten all of your input. Um, are we resuming recording, Kim? Are we good to go? Yes, we are good to go. Excellent. So, thanks again for joining us today. This is the first, as Kim said, the first of six one hour modules. So. Uh, you should know this is the first time we are doing it this way. So you are our guinea pigs, um, but uh, don't worry. We've had lots of practice and preparation. Uh, don't be concerned. I, I am just concerned that I may talk more quickly than you can understand. So I'm going to do my best to, to be articulate. want to start out uh, today's talk just by uh, asking a few questions. So I just put a question in the chat box. Take a look there. It says, how many suicidal patients have you managed in your career? Just want to understand who's in the room with us today. Uh, we all come from different walks of life, sometimes different specialties. So go ahead and put a number. A range is okay. If you want to say 10 to 20 or 500 to 600, that's fine. Okay. Harry Bounds said zero. Others in the room, I'll just give you another 30 seconds to put in a number. Thanks for that, Tina. Thanks for that, Jenny. And just while you're putting your numbers in there, uh, Julie, ideation is fine. Doesn't have to be attempts. Kim, hundreds, excellent. While you are putting your numbers in there, I use the word patient uh, versus client. The majority of medical, the majority of settings I work in with suicidal patients are medical settings, typically primary care. So I don't. Uh, there's no other intention behind the use of the word patient versus client. Some of you uh, might use the word client. Uh, Neil said 25 to 50. Julie 95. Okay, good. Okay, so we've got quite a range here. Some people zero, some as high as hundreds. So uh, the next question, don't, don't put that, that uh, chat box away yet. The next question here is how confident are you managing suicidal patients? And the scale is low, medium, or high. You can put an L, M, or H if you prefer. How confident are you managing suicidal patients? Okay, much quicker on the on the chat box this time. Well done, folks. Uh, looks like we have mostly lows, maybe a few mediums and one or two highs. That's great. So that's how confident you are. But now how comfortable are you? We can be highly confident in doing something, even though we may be very uncomfortable doing it, right? It's the old fake it till you make it idea. So um, <clears throat> the first one was uh, confidence. Uh, now we're asking about comfort. It looks like by and large, this is split between low and medium. Still waiting for a few people to put their input in the chat box. And we have one or two people abstaining from uh, putting their information in. Please, uh, I'm not gonna twist anyone's arm, but please do try to participate as best you can. That makes it more interesting for all of us. We learn more. Okay, so mostly lows and mediums there. Okay, great. Um, so one of the goals of this training is that you will leave uh, the training with more confidence and more comfort. Uh, 
treating suicidal patients, managing suicidal patients, it's quite common for me to get a phone call or an email uh, within days of people finishing this training and or even start actually starting the training to say, hey, it actually works. We, we used this stuff and it works. Um, what this stuff is, is called PROSPER. It's a proactive reduction of suicide in populations via evidence-based research. So what that means is I've taken all of the evidence-based literature in contemporary suicidology, which really means the last 50 years of suicide research, and uh, integrated it so that you can uh, benefit from it without having to go to those research journals and actually read those articles and studies. Here's our bibliography, our references. Not going to go through them at length. Here are our learning objectives. Not going to go through them at length. You've you've seen this uh, these before. Um, we did our our pre-course knowledge check, so we're good to go. Um, what I would ask is, uh, what are gatekeeper programs? Um, does anyone know what gatekeeper programs are? Feel free to put your comment in the chat box. What's a gatekeeper program? Uh, most folks are saying they don't know. Okay, that's great. So th this is the most fundamental type of suicide prevention program. Any state, any locality, any country, developed country in the world would have uh, its first step in suicide prevention would be a gatekeeper program. Julie Carmen, you're exactly right. You are the gatekeepers, right? So anyone who's in the uh, healthcare field, first responder field, even teachers uh, are considered gatekeepers. They're people who are oftentimes working with others and are likely to learn that someone is in distress or someone is struggling with thoughts of suicide. So the, so just to, to be clear here, uh, gatekeeper programs, you'll see things like assist, ask, start, um, QPR. These are sort of the very foundational uh, suicide prevention programs that we really do need to have. They are out about 30% effectiveness. In other words, they can help reduce suicides up to maybe a third. Um, and what we're going to talk about over the next six one-hour sessions are how to build on that, how we can take those sort of basics around gatekeeper programs and really lean in and lean forward and accomplish more. Uh, after 9-11, if you lived in any major city in, in, uh, in this country, any enormous city, you'd see signs like this. And that's exactly what gatekeeper training is. It's if you see something, say something. If you see a coworker struggling, if you see a patient struggling. So it's it's more about the entire community and it's less about your job as a healthcare provider. And what we know is that even though someone may clearly appear to be on the verge of drowning uh, and, and really appear to be in, in, a, in a heck of a storm, uh, doesn't mean that it's easy for us to ask, do you need some help? It may not be easy for them to admit they need some help. So there are myths out there that people uh, throw around. Oftentimes it's the idea that, well, if I ask someone who's distressed, if they're thinking of killing themselves, maybe I'll make that person suicidal as if they were not suicidal before, but in uh, asking the question, I've now made them suicidal. And we know that there's no evidence that you're gonna give anyone an idea they haven't already thought of, okay? So we should all feel confident that asking is the right thing to do. And in fact, some people say, well, if I ask, then what? That's where I have discomfort. I can ask any question once, but then what happens if they sort of open up? Well, obviously if it's in a healthcare context, there are some very specific things we'll talk about and that'll happen in the, in the later um, modules that we'll be doing together. But at the, the uh, most basic level, you just have to listen. So in the same way you would to a friend or a colleague or, or a family member, when we talk to suicide attempt survivors, so these are people who have attempted suicide and live to tell about it, they will say things like, all I wanted someone to do was to listen, but I didn't feel comfortable reaching out because I thought they would judge me if I said I'm thinking about killing myself. I thought they would um, think negative of me. Uh, negatively of me. And so it's sort of that idea of just being a good person. And I know that that sounds loaded, being a good person, how do we define that? But it really does mean just having the uh, wherewithal and the uh, initiative to ask the question and then to be able to just listen. Uh, the, you do want that to wrap up with, well, can we get you some help, whether that's the emergency department or a, a primary care appointment or what have you. Okay, but gatekeeper programs 
sometimes fall short of, of hitting the mark. We know that their effectiveness is around 30%. We said that already. But why else do they fall short of serving the, of hitting the mark? Why won't gatekeeper programs alone solve the problem? What can you all think of in the way of culture, in the way of um, uh, help-seeking behavior? Does everybody who needs help want it? Oh, Julie, you put a great point in the a great point in the chat box. Do they actually identify everyone? Yeah. So we're, we're just because we're asking doesn't mean we're going to identify everyone. So that's a great point. Let's look at some other points here. Uh, the the right help isn't always available, right? So <clears throat> uh, just because I can ask someone if they're thinking of harming themselves, when it comes to then getting them to a qualified medical provider, that may or may not be available. Not everyone's willing to help others. In certain cultures, we have a bit of an emphasis around privacy uh, or an emphasis around minding your own business. And people think, well, you know what? That's not my place to ask this person what's going on in their personal lives. That's, that's you know, if they ask, I'll, if they open that conversation, I, I'll engage with them, but I'm not going to initiate that, right? Uh, we also have uh, people who, um, we talked about that one, but sometimes there are cultural elements that run contrary. So there's mental health stigma out there, right? That it's not okay to ask for help. And so they may not ask. And even if we ask them, are you struggling? Are you, do you need some help? Sometimes seeking help doesn't, doesn't sound like it, it's uh, something that we are comfortable with. We know that men particularly are poor help seekers, whether we're talking about, I don't know, asking for directions when we're lost or whether we're talking about asking for mental health treatment. We, we study after study, men, do not seek help well. We, we might also offend someone uh, where they are uh, sensitive about what they're experiencing and they, they feel like we are uh, making some sort of value judgment about them, okay? I do a lot of work in, the, uh, in rural and frontier states. And so just wanna reiterate uh, this cultural piece there's sort of in, in uh, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, Idaho, there's a bit of a cowboy culture. It's sort of like a value for independence and self-sufficiency. And then you know what? If, if this life kills me uh, because I just can't hack it and I decide to kill myself, well, so be it. Uh, it beat me, uncle, right? I, I, I twist my arm, uncle, I'm, I'm toast. And uh, versus the idea of, well, if it's beating me, I better reach out and get some help so that I can overcome this. <clears throat> okay, so here's what here's the bad news, folks. Uh, we have had a persistent upward trend of suicides for the last half century. Uh, in fact, there's never been a time in American history, there's never been a time in Arkansas history or any other state or country where we have suppressed the suicide rate by, let's say, 20% and maintained that reduced rate for subsequent years. It's never happened. Even on years where we see a slight decrease in the numbers, we cannot unequivocally uh, attribute that to something. We can't reproduce that result. We can't even maintain that positive result. So for all intents and purposes, we do not have operational control over this public health problem. Uh, it's pretty clear that we have better operational control over COVID-19 at this point than we do suicide. Uh, and even when you compare it to the top 10 causes of death, we've got better control over managing those compared to suicide. Here's another way to show these data. The men are the blue lines and the females, um, women are the black lines. Uh, certainly we do see lower suicides by females compared to males. Um, and males, we do know, tend to use more lethal means. So they tend to rely on firearms. And that's probably one of the reasons why we see the higher numbers. Women are also better help seekers. So those are the two main reasons we would say there's a big difference in the data. This drop right here is, is a bit artificial that you see between the 80s, 90s and the millennial millennium, excuse me. Um, it's really due to the way mental health funding was allocated, reallocated, and the way documentation, uh, medical documentation works. So unfortunately, it's not really a true decrease. <clears throat> So who's the poster child for suicide? Who, who dies by suicide more than anyone else? Can, can you think of, of, of some demographics, maybe gender, race, or some other characteristic that comes to mind? We've, we've all been sort of, these data have been thrown at us. 
as if we know what to do with them. That's great. So in the chat box, older males, right? Middle-aged men. That's great. Typically white. Uh, that's right, Caitlin. And then typically who own a firearm. Okay. Um, the fastest growing group of suicidal patients are the 40, 45 through 65 age group. That's the fastest growing. So we see more suicides in that age bracket than any other age bracket. But we do know that lots of the suicides, uh, just the total amounts, are uh, the young folks. And some of that is due to their frontal lobe not being developed, lack of coping skills, poor judgment, impulsivity, things like that. <clears throat> Has knowing these facts, oh, Harry, so I'll put it in the chat box, 46 to it's actually, I believe, 68 is the fastest, fastest uh, cohort uh, in, in terms of the, the, they are dying by suicide. There are more of those per year than any others. That's an increasing group, probably related to many things, including disability status, chronic pain, accessibility to medications, things like that, opioids. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of like profiling it tends not to be very helpful. The reason why this is not helpful is because females, people of color, those who aren't in this age bracket kill themselves. They certainly kill themselves in ways that don't involve firearms. And so I would ask you in a rhetorical way, has knowing this profile helped us decrease suicides over the last 50 years? Um, Melissa, thanks for the answer. The answer in the chat box that she put is no, it hasn't, right? These, these facts have not helped us reduce suicides. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the data we looked at on the prior, prior slide. Similarly, what, are the, uh, what do you know are the most common triggers? So what are those life events that precede people's suicide attempts? And these are actual suicides, actually, these data. So Melissa said bills. I, I assume we're talking about finances. Harry says lost jobs. Caitlin says finances. That's great. What else? Typically loss of a relationship, right? And, it, and oftentimes it's a romantic relationship. Change of life. Well done, Tina. Relationships. Yep. Legal. Uh-huh. Let's take a look at, at, according to the CDC, these are the top seven. So relationship problems up top, then these others, uh, problematic substance use, a crisis coming up in two weeks or having previously happened two weeks ago, physical health problem, financial job, loss of housing, criminal legal. Of course, there are other problems, other triggers which precede suicides, but they, these were just the top seven, okay? And these data haven't changed uh, either. Uh, how many years have we known these data? What do you think? Put, put your answer in the chat box. For how many years have we known these common triggers for suicide? Harry says 50 years, wonderful. Anyone else want to guess? Yeah, it is about 50 years. Uh, it's between 30 and 50, but it's closer to 50, I believe. And so uh, I ask again, has knowing these factors helped us reduce suicides? Many of us are trained to look for these factors as if they're going to help us separate the people who are having difficulties in life uh, from the ones who are having difficulties in life and, and about to kill themselves. And it, it unfortunately just doesn't work that way. And, and what I'd like to talk to you about on this slide is sort of an expanded method of doing this thing that doesn't work. Uh, all of these factors on this slide are the 67 risk factors known to be associated with suicide. Now, these are between subjects research. What that means is we take, let's say, a thousand people who have died by suicide and we look at all of their characteristics. And then we run statistical analyses to find out which characteristics are present more than just probability, uh, sort of a 50 50 shot. And whatever those uh, percentages are, we then weigh them. So, for example, uh, anorexia is here, right, right at this left side of the slide, maybe that's slightly more than chance. And so we say, okay, well, then it's a risk factor for suicide because it's present in this population slightly more than it than just happenstance. But maybe an alcohol use disorder is much more uh, not due to chance. And so we would weigh that higher. So all of these factors have different weights to them. 
The problem is we can't take a checklist of factors like this, of risk factors, and then use it in an individual way, uh, what's called a repeated subjects or within subjects fashion. Um, this sounds kind of uh, puzzling because we do this all the time with many things in our world, even outside of medicine. But here's a good example of other between subjects research. So there is uh, between subjects research that shows the taller you are in height, the more successful you will be in your career. And so if that's true, that's between subjects research. We looked at a thousand people who have had massive career success and looked at all their characteristics and the statistical analyses say that their height played a role. Well, so does that mean as an employer that I can interview people and use their height as the main decision maker as to whether I don't hire them or do hire them. Of course we can't do that. Not only is it illegal, but it's not, it's not a sound way to operate, right? And so if, if we can't take big data that way and apply it to an individual in front of us in that context, uh, of course we can't do it in this context either. So uh, if you are accustomed to completing a risk assessment by looking at factors like this, please consider that it's, it's a misuse of the research. And, and I am just as frustrated as, as many of you are that that's how we were trained. It's clearly not working. And we have a recent meta-analysis and another study which concludes that very thing, that over the last 50 years of research, we can't look at a bunch of factors and just predict who's going to kill themselves. Our ability to predict future suicidal events is essentially zero. So what do we do instead? Well, we'll talk about that probably on the second and third modules. But what I would like to elucidate now are some of the other reasons why we're not bending the suicide curve. Let's just look at this from a logic perspective. When someone comes in and says, I'm feeling depressed, we don't go back retrospectively and do a, a risk assessment for depression. Someone comes in and has a positive cancer finding. We don't go retrospectively to look for, hmm, what's this person's risk for getting cancer? They have the cancer, they have the depression, we treat what's in front of us. So why when someone comes in and says, I'm thinking of killing myself, do we go backwards and do a risk assessment instead of addressing what they verbalized to us, which is that I'm thinking of ending my life. So it really defies the rest of medicine and how we practice. And if you are familiar with this sort of strategy to, to ask about suicidal ideation plans and intent, that is over 50 years old. So in terms of being very outdated, this is, this is not a, a um, current evidence-based way best practice. And again, I'm sorry if some of this surprises you. It's, it's, if it doesn't, that's great. Um, but there, there are many people who we come in contact with through these webinars who are, are confused to hear that this is outdated literature. Uh, and that's why we're doing this. And that's why we'll cover some of this on, on the third, second and third modules. So here's something else that happens in the field is we have this problematic cycle among healthcare providers. We have two different, three different styles, but the most common ones are better safe than sorry and cavalier. We'll go through each of them quite briefly. So the, the better safe than sorry approach sounds like this. I just don't know if this patient's going to do it, if, if he's going to kill himself. So let's play it safe and give him a, a crisis response plan or a safety plan and let's get him to the hospital. Or it sounds like this, I, I, I believe her when she says she wants to live, but she's also telling me she wants to kill herself. And my gut says we're better just sending her to the hospital and making sure that she's safe. So these better safe than sorry approaches, uh, put, put in the chat box, let me sort of interrupt my own flow for a moment, put in the chat box, true or false, the vast majority of patients that I have known were psychiatrically hospitalized for suicide had a great experience. True or false, the vast majority of patients I know who have been psychiatrically hospitalized for suicide have had a great experience. <clears throat> okay, we've got about five out of 14 people, five out of 15 Okay, so now we're getting a little closer, maybe eight to 10, still waiting for five of you. So everybody has put false so far. Um, and that's generally the way it works when I ask that question, which is why I routinely ask it every time we do trainings like this. Um, 
Uh, Julie, you've had two that felt their experience was beneficial. That is wonderful. That is two more than, uh, you know, that's wonderful. Thank goodness. Um, thank God. And, and uh, I, sh I hesitate to ask you what the denominator was, Julie. In other words, how many total patients have you treated with, with suicide? Um, but when we work with psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, uh, professional counselors, behavior analysts, nurses, physicians, DOs, PAs, NPs, you name it. Time and time again, they answer this question that it seldom happens, if ever. And so does that mean we hate the inpatient community? Of course not. But what it does mean is that if it's leading to a negative patient experience, which then leads to future non-disclosure, if they have a negative experience, guys, they're not going to tell us in the future when they're struggling. And so follow this red line, we're just maintaining the population risk. <clears throat> so we've got to do something differently. This approach is not working. And if it were, if it were working, wouldn't we have decreased suicide rates instead of the sawtooth ascending suicide rates that we looked at a few moments ago? Cavalier approach. This is most prevalent, I've observed it uh, in uh, rural settings, rural primary care oftentimes where the, the PCP will say, look, I don't ask routinely about it because I don't know if the patient said, yes, I am suicidal, I wouldn't even know what to do. The nearest hospital is hundred miles away. The nearest behavioral health facility is 300 miles away. So I don't ask unless they offer that information. So there are obvious uh, problems with that, even though I think we can all appreciate the challenges of rural medicine and we can understand some of that sentiment. But at the end of the day, we are potentially violating our own ethics. We're not meeting the standard of care. We're not meeting the evidence-based literature. Patient is not, uh, none of that risk is mitigated. The patient remains unsafe. So follow that red arrow back up here. We're maintaining the risk. What few medical providers use, and, and that's sort of a catch-all in, in this context, no matter what your discipline or your license is, few of those in the medical fields will use an accurate approach. And I will say it's also the mental health fields. And we'll talk about their, um, their data in a moment. If we can develop mutual trust, now think about this. Mutual trust means I trust whatever this patient tells me about his or her suicidal thoughts. That's hard, right? Because in the medical community, we're trained to look at objective and subjective data, data and then to marry them. And what you're telling me is that I should really focus mostly on the subjective data that this patient's giving me. Uh, and, and that is what I'm saying. Um, if we do, and if we are working with an accurate approach, we are empowering the patient. We're meeting the standard of care. At the end of the day, they have a positive experience with sharing those deep, dark thoughts. And that leads to future disclosure. Whether they end up hospital, we, we end up hospitalizing them or not, at least we have heard them for what they're saying versus been better safe than sorry, taking the paternalistic, maternalistic approach, maybe a heavy handed approach. Uh, suicide is a state of powerlessness. The last thing we need to, need to be doing is usurping more power from people who already feel powerless. <clears throat> uh, I see Tina's comment in the chat box. I'm going to sort of bookmark that um, for a moment. Um, yeah, so no, I'm not going to bookmark it because the last part here is is uh, sort of really, really drives the point home is that uh, the person you're talking about would not tell someone in the ER because they uh, made it worse. They forced him to stay. Right. So usurping power and control from someone who is seeking help and assistance, they're already feeling powerless. It's not helpful. Um, so patient empowerment is really the only way to go. And, and again, we're going to talk about how to do that. It, it sounds a lot harder than it is. And, and to be honest, the patient trust is a lot easier than it sounds as well. Um, the reality is it just takes breaking some of our old habits. So what happens when a whole system full of providers engages in better safe than sorry approaches and or cavalier approaches? Well, what we get, clearly I did not go to college for graphic design. <laughs> if we have this pattern here, um, what happens over time is that leads to no change in the suicide trends. And when we have no changes in uh, this condition, we see people demanding more beds. 
they say, look, the number of patients in need outnumbers the number of psych beds. We must build more psych hospitals, or we must expand the current ones so we have more beds. Well, we all know there's the build that they will come uh, phenomenon. And so what we do know is that if we build more beds, then we start using those beds. And, and chances are we're not even using any of the contemporary suicide management skills we might have learned that we might have learned in like, a, I don't know, just off the top of my head, a six module, one hour per module training virtually. I don't know, just, just pulling that out of the air. Um, and so we won't use those skills, which means people don't receive help upstream, right? They're not receiving help in primary care. They're just sort of getting sent straight to the hospital. So over time, this just makes the population uh, level of risk rise. And we already have data showing that. So when we look from 08 to 15, uh, children five to 17, we see this sawtooth increase of hospitalizations due to suicidal ideation or suicide attempts. And uh, the sad news is uh, there's never been a randomized controlled trial or other high quality study showing that psychiatric hospitalization reduces suicides or that it even uh, treats the suicidal symptoms. What it does is it decreases the opportunity decreases the opportunity for the person to kill themselves. So we know that 25% of people uh, within one week of discharge from a psych hospital will uh, die by suicide. We know that the, uh, the suicide risk rate is about 100 times the global rate during the first three months after discharge and about 200 times the global rate upon discharge. So at the end of the day, it's, I would argue it's not even within the psych hospital's normal role to do the treatment. They're, they are there for stabilization and stabilization is what they do. If someone needs 24 seven supervision, the psych hospital does a good job. The problem is there's a 25% fallout that's unintended and we end up discharging patients into the stressful, uh, miserable, intolerable environment that produce their suicidal symptoms to begin with. And so therefore it is up to the outpatient community to more directly address this and to do more about addressing this. There's really just no, no alternative. And when we say outpatient medical community, we're talking about mental health and primary care. <clears throat> Hold on to your seats for this one. This is kind of un unfortunate. So, okay, so mental health is, is, is the answer. Yes, let's get everyone to the mental health providers. Let's open access, get, get the best access to psychologists and social workers and mental health counselors. Well, here's the problem. Less than 50% of the graduate school programs in America and Canada even give formal training on suicide risk management. And of the ones that do provide that training, the average duration is under two hours. So we're talking about arguably the most lethal condition a therapist would have to address and, and only about half the schools provide any training and it's about two hours. Could you imagine if in medical school dealing with a myocardial infarction, which is one of the most fatal conditions a, a cardiologist or even a family physician would have to deal with, could you imagine if less than, less than half of them got trained and the ones who did get trained got about two hours or less of training? There's no way that would, that would fly there would be PR outcry. So why is it that in the mental health field, this terrible lack of, of training and expertise has persisted? It's, it's a crime. And so then if we say, okay, well, okay, that's grad school. Though. We all know we learn, there's OJT, on-the-job training. We all know that we have continuing education credits and all of that. So don't, don't therapists learn uh, after they graduate from graduate school? Well, the, the answer is maybe. Uh, we know that studies of therapists show that they will actively avoid taking on these patients in the same way to be fair in the same way some uh, family physicians or pcps will avoid opioid patients okay it's just it, it, it's it's a thing it happens i don't think we can deny it but uh <clears throat> so and then a third of therapists won't even ask about risk and when we ask these therapists how come you don't follow the evidence-based guidelines? How can you hesitate or, or avoid taking these patients? They say, we don't have the skills, we don't have the community resources, and we're not comfortable. We don't have the comfort. So that's part of why one of the goals for PROSPER 
uh, for you all is to increase your comfort so we can help overcome that barrier that the literature tells us exists. The other piece about I don't have enough resources in the community, the sad news is you are those resources therapists, just like PCPs are those resources, nurses are those resources. We have a collective responsibility to lean in harder and farther than we've been doing. And the reason why is because what we've been doing isn't working. We have a continued ascending suicide problem. And so what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, but just expecting a different, income, uh, different outcome, right? So we can do more. Clearly we can do more. If you are a leader within the healthcare field and financials um, appeal to you, and that, that's a big part of this, like the old saying goes, where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of the cure, every dollar spent on a psychotherapeutic intervention or strengthening linkages in the system uh, will save $250. Okay, so a few other concepts here, and then we'll, we'll sort of wrap up. We've got about 15 minutes left. <clears throat> we want to make sure we finish these on time every week, and let's start out on the right foot. So according to the Suicide uh, Prevention Resource Center, now this is part of SAMHSA, or, uh, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a part of HHS, so our federal government's Health and Human Services Department. These nine facets are, are essential to comprehensive suicide prevention approach. Now here's the problem. Only the ones circled in green are the ones we tend to do well. We're really great at gatekeeper training. And if you see something, say something. Uh, how many years ago was the first time any of you sat for a training on assist or QPR or ask? How many years ago? Don't worry, we won't do the math to figure out how old you are. There's no embarrassment here. How many years ago did you first see an assist training or some sort of training, zero suicides, whatever it is, S. Davis? five years, okay, anyone else? For me, it was 20. No one else has ever had a gatekeeper training, that's impossible. Any joint commission accredited facility requires it annually. You probably just see, see how effective it is? You don't even know you've had the training. <laughs> um, that's just a tongue in cheek joke, guys. But we do this, Julie says, none in almost 30 years of healthcare. That's astounding. So, and, and so Julie, Julie said none, and this is supposed to be something we're doing well. You see this? You see how this works, guys? Even though from, from a system perspective, we think we're doing well on this. Julie just said, I haven't had any in 30 years. Um, so we're good at having that crisis line or the, the crisis hotline, the crisis lifeline. We're good at that. We're good at sending EMS, fire, rescue to do welfare checks. So those identify and assist, responding to crises and the care linkages, we're pretty good at that stuff. Okay. Obviously we're not perfect. Um, but what we're kind of stinky at are these other, other, um, six things, right? Um, so increasing help seeking behavior, uh, that is a multi pronged problem, right? That is a multi headed dragon, multi headed monster. We have the access issue that we can, in, we can increase help seeking all day, but then if people go and the doors are closed and there's a wait list or they can't get in, it's not helpful, right? Uh, certainly we can do more to help everyone increase help seeking behavior. We can also do more in the way of life skills and resilience. With suicidal patients, we tend to jump from this, if you see something, say something, to, okay, let's get them right to the hospital. And it's sort of like this extreme response to what may not need hospitalization. And so we can do more in the way of bolstering people's self-help skills. We have, if you see something, say something, and that's wonderful. But what we don't have is if you notice something in yourself, help yourself. Okay, and that's part of what we're trying to accomplish here with Prosper is it's not just about leveraging each other as a community, it's about leveraging our own inner strengths and our own resources that we know people have. Okay, then there's connectedness, even though we've all got smartphones and, and gosh, isn't life convenience when you can order a pizza, order an Uber, get your groceries delivered. We are connected in those ways, but the reality is we remain a very individualistic culture. 
people are, are uh, families are smaller and smaller. We have decreasing uh, rates of active faith-based life uh, being religious. That's on the downcline uh, decline as well. So some of those ways of being connected, we can do better at. And they, they are the, the trouble with them is they run contrary to the larger American culture. Then we have postvention. Postvention is something that is intended to prevent a contagion. So after there's a suicide, we process it a bit. It helps people gain some closure and prevents it from really blowing up and becoming a, a contagious thing. Then we have uh, effective care and treatment. Put in the chat box, uh, what do you think that these are data we, we I pulled myself actually, um, but we pulled them several years ago, about a decade ago. What percentage of mental health providers use evidence-based care? What do you think the percentages of social workers, psychologists, um, psychiatrists, um, mental health counselors, what percent use evidence-based care in America? Jenny guessed 15. Do I hear 30? Harry says 30. Great. Okay. Other guesses? <clears throat> the question is what percentage of licensed mental health providers in America use evidence-based care? So the answer is 10%. Okay. Now that's, that's abysmal in my opinion. That's uh, no wonder the suicide rate is climbing. No wonder we've never really dropped the mental health rates for the last half century the prevalence of mental health problems is around 25%. We've never improved it, okay? We've improved all sorts of other medical conditions, but the mental health system itself is quite broken. Um, and, it's, and that's why we see a lot of integration of behavioral health into primary care to try to bring it under the, the rubric and, and auspices of something that we know can work and does work. Uh, and that has a whole bunch of funding and attention around models and processes that that work for patients, but we can do better with effective care and treatment. And, and you are doing better by even just attending this, okay? Because what we'll go over in probably uh, segments five and six or modules five and six will hit on this. And so what I'm saying is that Prosper attempts to shore up these other six. Now we spend least time here and the least time here, but uh, let's wrap up with reducing access to firearms. Firearms are one of the biggest reasons why people uh, die by suicide. And uh, the hardest part about this conversation is it tends to trigger people's, no pun intended, trigger people's second amendment rights, okay? They get concerned that this is a gun rights issue and it's really not. Uh, what we know about suicide attempts is that whatever people have available is what they will reach for. If you really, really, really want to die versus this other person who really wants to die, that doesn't mean the first person reaches for a firearm and the second person reaches for five Tylenol or 10 Tylenol. People will reach for whatever they have access to. Uh, and if that, if that plan unravels and doesn't go well, they don't switch to accessing a different type. So if I planned to take 50 Tylenol and then accidentally my wife threw them out, I don't all of a sudden say, okay, well, now I'm going to go find a noose and hang myself in the garage. What happens when their plan is thwarted is they, they get through it. They kind of calm down. So there is something very critical about this period of when the patient's suicidal mode is turned on. And we'll talk about that next time, what the suicidal mode is. It's that moment where they're very worked up and seriously thinking of killing themselves there are some things we can do that absolutely uh, make living much more likely. And one of those things is having delayed access to firearms, okay? Um, and if we have these conversations with, with firearm owners and we talk about it just in terms of gun safety, and we, we'll do that uh, at some point during these modules, if we just have a frank conversation about when is it a good idea to lock your firearm up to, to, to make sure that access isn't so easy, they come up with lots of good ideas. And, and they are true ideas. Uh, and then we say, well, what if someone is living in your house happens to be suicidal? They'll say, yeah, it's a good idea to have it locked up. The glitch is when we say, well, what if that person is you? And that's where the gears start turning because it's as if they don't believe that they would ever do it. And then sometimes, or for some others, it's not that they don't believe they would do it. It's that they overestimate their impulse control. And they'll, they'll say, um, that's not me. 
I know how to I know how to handle myself and my firearm. Okay. So let's we're gonna sort of wrap out up here. Uh, there's some important pieces of suicide language that I want to point out. We avoid these because among uh, suicide attempt survivors, so again, an attempt survivor, someone who attempted and lived, and then suicide loss survivors, I'm going to put that one in the chat box, suicide loss survivors <clears throat> are those who have lost a loved one to suicide, okay, so they've survived that suicide loss. In interviewing them and talking to them, these words are not helpful. They tell us that these words are judgmental. They make it less likely that they would raise a flag in the future. Um, so, and, and to be truthful, these sorts of terms don't really follow an empirical basis. If we look in the research and say, okay, what exactly is a parasuicide versus a threat? What exactly does that look like? And what are the downstream effects of this behavior and this behavior? The research isn't there. So these end up being sort of like terms that medical providers will use when discussing a case. And, and what they end up doing is really just feeding the status quo. So let's say Kim and I are discussing a case together and I'll say, oh, it was just a suicide gesture. What we're basically saying is do not change anything about our treatment plan, stay the course, we're not worried about that. Or, well, it was just a suicidal threat. It was just a cry for help. They're not really going to do it. So these are, these are social terms, pop culture terms. They're not medical terms. They're not research terms. So please avoid using these. Um, we will go over next time how to use these instead. And we'll go over a, um, just a, we'll, we'll go over it probably quickly at the beginning. What I'd like to wrap up with in the last few minutes is, uh, just a list of resources. Some of these I will show you at the beginning of every hour we have together or at the end of every hour so that you have them. Here are some books. I don't get any financial or other kickbacks from these books. There's, there's no conflict of interest here. On the left, this is the only book I know of that's, that's written for primary care clinics on how to manage suicidal patients from both a workflow model and a clinical model. If you do have behavioral health integrated into your clinic, it was written with that in mind. Uh, taking into account those professionals, those clinicians. This is a CBT treatment manual for suicide. Uh, this has been shown to reduce suicidal behaviors by 60%. Uh, just as a point of reference, uh, that is um, when we do our best possible depression treatments, state-of-the-art combination of meds plus therapy, we get about 60%. So if you're confident with your ability to, to treat depression, uh, if you're a mental health provider, picking up this treatment manual and learning how to do it should give you a ton of confidence uh, managing suicidal patients. And this is a book that I believe is, is on Amazon, but not yet released. I think you can pre-order it. This really goes through a discussion of why we're not bending the curve. Um, uh, this is Dr. Craig Bryan uh, and, uh, Michael Rudd, uh, really premier suicidologists in our country. Uh, they've done the lion's share uh, of the work in the last 20 years in this area. Well, 40 years if you include Rudd. Um, and then feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions or comments or if I can be helpful. If there's something that you picked up in this talk today that you somehow apply with a patient tomorrow or next day or next week, please let me know how it went. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your participation. I've got about three or four minutes left for questions. I just wanted to point out, Dr. Corso, um, I know I've attended your trainings a couple of times, but I think that um, for me, a good takeaway when I attended was as I go through the week, and I encounter suicidal patients, how, what's coming up in those situations? How am I talking to them? What issues are they bringing up? So that um, people can bring these questions back over the next five weeks as an opportunity to um, potentially ask some questions and start to apply the material. So that was a fundamental shift for me as I went from the antiquated way of using, you know, terms that we've been practicing or, or using for 50 years to um, a more modern method of 
those aren't really effective and I wasn't having the results I needed. Um, what can I do differently? So just wanted to put that out there. Thanks for that. And in some cases, uh, we don't know if what we're doing is effective because we never see the patient again. And we don't know if we never saw them because they died or we never saw them because it worked, right? Just like if we hospitalize someone and take a better safe than sorry approach, if they never come back in and share suicidal thoughts, maybe they come back in for other stuff. Mm -hmm. We would like to assume that means they're not struggling with them, but we can't make that assumption, especially with all of the feedback we get from patients that it's not a good experience. I'm interested in the um, well, uh, in our family, we had um, one of my relatives who was uh, planning to um, take his life, and his wife called, didn't know what to do. Um, she felt it was imminent, and she called the police. The police came. He didn't want to get out of bed. He had his hands under his cover, and uh, for whatever reason, they tased him. And then they took him to the emergency room. They said uh, to be glad that he wasn't taken to jail. Anyway, my whole point was a uh, family member getting this type of training, getting this understanding out that hospitalization may not be, especially with uh, what appears to be incredibly poor training of uh, law enforcement. Right. So th thanks for pointing that out, Jenny, and for sharing such a personal story. One of the arms to prosper is that training you just mentioned. It's talking to community members so that they understand how to recognize these things in themselves, but also so that they understand a bit about what's going on with one of their loved ones or their children or a friend who might be experiencing this. And then we also have an arm where we bring law enforcement into the conversation and make sure they have some of the same training. Our, our uh, policemen and policewomen really are ill-equipped to deal with the myriad of mental health issues they come in contact with every day in the community. And uh, not, only, not only do they not get use of force training multiple times annually, some people get it every two years. And then we wonder why uh, we, we have firearms discharged prematurely. Um, so, so the law enforcement- it's been shot. Yeah. Easily. Absolutely. So, so we definitely, to your point, we definitely need better, better training for law enforcement. So thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have a uh, one o'clock central time. So uh, any last questions before we go, otherwise I'll let you go. I don't want to uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you again for this opportunity. Looking forward to speaking with you next week. Thank you, Dr. Corso. Yes, we want to end on time um, and we will see you all next week. Same, same time, same place. And uh, I can't tell you, I'm looking forward to it. And um, please tell your colleagues to join us and we will be sending out a recording. Thank you.